Olá a todos, sejam muito bem-vindos a mais uma live aqui no canal. Hello do BTG and welcome to another live of BTG Pactual Digital. Today we receive the Minister of Economy, Mr. Paulo Guedes. I would like to remind all of you to subscribe to our channel to receive our notifications of our contents. To talk to us, the CEO of Asset Management of BTGZ. Pactual, Eduardo Guardia, will interview Mr. Paulo Guedes, the Minister of Finance. Good afternoon to all. And first of all, I would like to thank the Minister for your availability to be here today to talk to you, us. And this is such a difficult moment for the country, and it involves so much sacrifice for the population, and it's a great responsibility for you as the minister to take such difficult decisions to mitigate the effects of this very serious crisis. I'm sure that we'll have a great series of questions to our minister, Paulo Guedes, and he will present without interruptions. And in the end, we will open for questions to the minister. I would just like to ask, before st the minister starts speaking, uh, I would like to mention four very important topics for the current economic debate. Two are in the very, very short term, which have to do with the necessity to leave the lockdown and the capacity to people to move about without collapsing the health system, and also the efficacy of the measures announced by the government to mitigate the effects of this crisis. So these are very short-term issues that I would like to discuss, and I see two very important topics that need to start being discussed even though this may be implemented a bit further down the road. First, we have the need to start thinking about resuming the economy after the isolation period. So how will we do this? Which sectors will be affected? What is our capacity to bear with this cost? And finally, resuming the reforms and how will we bear the costs resulting from this crisis. So this is a fundamental topic that we need to discuss in the near future. So how will we pay for this and how will we distribute the cost of the fiscal impact of this crisis? So these are very complex topics that need to be dealt with and nobody better to discuss on this than our minister Paulo Guedes. So once again, minister, thank you very much for your availability to be here with us. And the word is yours. Good afternoon to all. I will start on the same note that I have used when I talk to you. Everything will work out. I am very sure that the Brazilian democracy is capable of processing this. It is noisy, it pushes this way and that way, the powers are defining their spaces and this is absolutely normal. We are seeing a definition of spaces, but I reassure this at every opportunity that I have that we are seeing an improvement at an institutional level. The country has very high expectations. So we crossed a very good first year. We did the reforms. There was an expectation to construct between the executive power and the legislative power 
uh, strong ties. We were unsure if uh, Congress would support the, the, the reforms. And there was a lot of questions on different topics. Would this be based on the public opinion? And I mentioned this in the, the VOS meeting last year. I said that Brazil would surprise everyone and millions of people in the streets of France against the social security reform in Brazil and millions of people in Brazil in favor of the social security reform. So parliament worked, we had a lot of positive inputs and Brazil moved forward. Brazil moved forward and we were able to decrease two important expenditures. We had the first great problem. First, we had a general diagnosis. This general diagnosis was that public expenditure was uncontrolled. It was growing exponentially. We had this snowball effect. Brazil was spending 300, 400 billion reais and we were just paying interests of all the loans that we took and we lost the capacity to grow and then taxes increased the uh, prime rates increased and Brazil stagnated. So Brazil was in a perverse mechanism. And the car wash operation was an attack to this degeneration dimension of the Brazilian democracy. And on the other hand, the economy was at a halt. So the economic model was wrong. The excessive public expenditure led Brazil to a snowball indebtedness, high taxes, and imprisoned the country in low growth. So Brazil was a prisoner of low growth, high interest rates, a very high foreign exchange rate, and this worsened our industrialization process. And this was not the fault of A, B, or C. There were several merits as well, but part of this growth of expenditures was at the cost of the weaker parts. So we did not have a decentralized health system, which now we are using, and also a decentralized social assistance system, which we are now using. So I believe a lot in the Brazilian democratic process. The Brazilian democracy is an important institutional advancement. For decades, I feel that we have not lost the countermeasures. If we are including the weaker parties in the public budgets, if we are extending social care, health, we had to cut down on other things. We need to needed to transform the Brazilian state, and this is fully underway. We started this year very optimistic. So what was happening in Congress? Differently from last year, where there was a lot of struggling, this year we were in a virtuous process. The House had already aligned with us the administrative reform, and we had already started negotiating with the Senate the federative agreement. And with this, we would, we would be able to start the tax reform. Everything was well underway. The reporters, they were well aligned with us. Marcio Mitar was working with TEC Ampla, and they were fully aligned with us. Their team was aligned with ours. Senator Otto Legar working together with our team and building all the different measures. And in the same fashion, Senator Oriovisto also working on the emergency bill, 
to generate a fiscal space for this. And everything was basically aligned. Davi Alcolumbre, the president of the Senate, was dealing with all this in a very constructive way. So he suggested to make a breakdown threefold. From this, we had the emergency bill and the other bills so that we could have greater representativeness in the Senate. And under the recommendation of President Davi Alcolumbre, we divided this bill into three parts so that we would have one realtor in the senator in the Senate and also a group of parties focusing on another bill and another group of parties focusing on another bill. So we started the year very optimistic about this year. So we would have very little political noise despite the upcoming elections because there was a huge alignment between the president of the House of Representatives and of the Senate and the president providing the fundamentals to transform the Brazilian state. So we were moving in this direction. In Davos, the, it was said that the global economy is decelerating, but Brazil is starting to take off. And I repeat, the first half of this year, the first quarter of this year, when compared to the first quarter of Temer, we grew 0.7. And don't forget that we had Brumadinho and we also had the automotive industry collapse. This really affected our exports. So we started the year starting at 0.7. In the second quarter, we were at 0.9. The third quarter, we were at 1.1. And the fourth quarter, we were at 1.7. So a lot of political uh, discussion that we grew, we didn't grow. No, the first year we dedicated to reforms. We would just grow after the reforms. Even so, we were able to grow 1.1, but 1.1 is the IBGE calculation in March. When they did the same calculation over the last two years, before our government, in the two years of President Tamer, it was the same thing. It was 0. Uh, 0 and 0 0.1, and in September, they revised this to 1.3. So the Brazilian economy was already growing at around 1.7, and by the end of the year, it was around 1.3, 1.4. Taxes levied in the first two and a half months. Toshi, the secretary, of Internal Revenue Services stated that we grew at 2.4%, which was above the expectation of 2.4%. So there are a lot of uh, political uh, speculations around this. Maybe the levy taxes was dropping, but that's not it. In February of last year, we had the best record in levied taxes for February. In January, we had the best January in our history in terms of taxes levied. In February, we had the second best month because in February of last month, it was very high because as soon as we uh, took office, we sold off a lot of companies and a lot of taxes were collected. So you take one month of this year and you compare this to an exceptional month of last year and you say that you're not uh, collecting enough taxes. We have already learned how to deal with this. It's sad, but that's part of life. Some people, they provide good information, others poor information, but time is the best remedy of all. 
So, an excellent beginning of year, several industries commenting with us that they were having double-digit growth. Many companies were celebrating. I don't want to mention names so that I don't seem that I'm directioning this to one or another company, but great entrepreneurs of the civil construction sector were growing at double digits and others growing at single digits, uh, private credit growing very, very well here in Brazil because we delivered some of the public banks and private credit expanded. In January and February, we had a lot of optimism. The hotel that I would stay at in Brasilia, they had events every day. The hotel was packed. Uh, they were very happy with the results. Everyone was uh, celebrating the growing of the Brazilian economy. So we were just starting when the coronavirus struck us. So when the crisis started in China, uh, many people asked me, did you find out about this in February or in December? We were following the global economy. We knew that in December there was a serious health issue in China. But we were monitoring the economic dimension. So if China decelerated, what would be the impact on Brazil? This confirms our first expectations. Brazilian exports did not drop yet. They are increasing, as a matter of fact, because the drop in exports to Europe was compensated. Our exports to the U.S. dropped more than 30 percent. The drop to Argentina was more than 20 percent. It was compensated by the accelerated exports. Guess to whom? To China. So when we started following the economic dimension of the Chinese crisis, we knew this was a pandemic and we were following this as if it were a Chinese health issue that would affect the integrated supply chains around the world but would not have an effect on Brazil. And this seems like a reasonable work hypothesis. So we are not observing a drop in exports to China. So this is why we are starting to monitor the Chinese crisis, not thinking of the pandemic. Since in Brazil we have Zika and Dengue and we have health issues like this, they have the H1N1, the h one n two, and now COVID. So we were just following the economic dimension of this, which is our area. When at the end of March it struck us that this was a pandemic, the next day we were aware of this tragic dimension of public health and we got together as a group and we started designing the measures. Everything that we could do in terms of our internal infrastructure, we did. We reduced the mandatory taxes. So we reduced around 200 million of mandatory taxes. We also, the following week, anticipated all the benefits for retirees and people receiving pensions. So we went to the most frail area of society, the retirees. We anticipated a 13th salary to May and the other ha the half in April and another half in May. And we immediately included 1.2 million families in the Bolsa Família. So this was the object of much fraud, but we cleaned that up 
And then we started including families again in this program, and we immediately reverted this. We immediately inverted this. We included everyone. So we decided, let's put everyone inside this program, and later we will start investigating to see who is entitled to this or not. So we included 1.2 million families under the protection of this fund. And we reduced the taxes. So we reduced the so-called simple taxes to protect the smaller companies and also the severance fund. All of this is infra-constitutional. We have to work within our limitations so that we do not uh, give rise to any request for impeachment. So we worked first in deferring these anticipations. So we had another 150 billion reais and immediately we released 100 million in loans in available credit lines by means of Caixa Econômica Federal. First 70 and then another 30 on the following week. And the same thing with BNDES, the Development Bank of Brazil. When you add all this up, in two, three weeks, we inverted almost 500 billion reais, 200 mandatory, 150 billion for the most of, mostly affected by these measures, and we did this via Caixa Econômica Federal, plus another 50 billion from BNDES. So 500 billion reais, which will be injected into the Brazilian economy in the next three months. So we left the structural reforms and started a mode of emergency measures. The President's definition for this moment is to preserve lives and jobs. Measures that could help the economy so that it could preserve its vital signals. The president signaled this, but he was poorly interpreted. You have the first wave, which is of health, and the second wave, which has to do with the economy. So you have to work with both waves. We cannot let this become a Great Depression. We need to be very careful to save all lives possible, but we need to preserve the vital signs of the economy. It's like a bear hibernating. When it leaves the cave, it leaves strong and will celebrate life. It did not lose its vital signs. It just saved energy. And this is what we have to do. We will continue paying our light bill because otherwise the working capital of the power companies will dry up and we will continue paying for telecommunications, and that's what we're doing nowadays. The same thing has to do with the super harvest. Minister Mis, uh, Maria Cristina, and also supply, like Ministro Tarcísio's area. Food needs to be distributed to all cities. We can reduce some lines of activity, but we cannot discontinue the signs that will preserve life. Maybe we will return in a V-shape. Instead of having a Great Depression, we need the capacity to be able to react down the road. We will once again surprise the world. Last year, nobody believed abroad in our capacity to deal with the diverging opinions. And Brazilian democracy once again reassured itself, processed the reforms despite all the noise. Noise occurs every day, but the measures are moving forward, and Brazil is progressing. This week, 
sorry, last week, we had the spring meetings of the IMF. They were also done by teleconference. The Brazilian measures are the same or in some cases ahead of many other countries, including emerging countries. Of all the emerging countries, some that are considered advanced, our programs are being complemented around the world by the IMF, the World Bank, and this morning, this entire morning, we had the, uh, the BRICS Development Bank. We were sharing experiences, and India was able to include 230 million citizens in social assistance programs by digitizing everything. And Brazil did more because Brazil is including 60 million. So proportionately, we carried out digital and social inclusion much more quickly. We will distribute emergency assistance to informal workers to almost 60 million Brazilians. And this in record time, in two, three weeks, we designed the program and we will launch this very soon. Of course, the implementation takes some time. So we preferred using digital channels. This takes a bit longer until we approve all the different records. So we need the record with the Internal Revenue Service and also with the social uh, programs, the sole registrar, as it is called here. And what about the invisible Brazilians, taxi drivers, informal workers that never needed the government, and now they need help from the government because there's nobody circulating on the streets. So we designed these programs in record time. So we didn't use any model from abroad as a reference. We used our own models. And we created a lot of different programs. And the primary impact will depend on the GDP drop, but we are ready to really counteract this. So we will be able to react in terms of 3 4%. And maybe we'll have a, a tax impact of 6%. This impact continues to increase, but when you use the anticipations and credit lines, you, this might represent more than a trillion, and the central bank is also doing its part. We held more than eight emergency meetings on Saturday, Sunday with the Monetary Council, so the central bank is approving extraordinary measures and we are opening new paths. Since we don't have a central bank, it works as a Federal Reserve outside and it works in this small, in its own shell and does not have contact with the real market. In Brazil, our capacity to reach the real sector is much smaller than the Federal Reserve, but we need to start at some point. So we placed all of this in this emergency bill. 70, 80 percent of what is there is exactly to open this space for us to act, both for us so that we can act according to the Constitution, the Golden Rules, the central bank also being able to reach out to the real sector. All of this is placed there with a lot of support. But it's a lot of work to do all of this. It's very hard work. And we're doing this in record time. Everyone is working very hard. The Congress, the Senate, the President, the ministers, 
of the Supreme Court that are also pushing very hard. And they need to revisit something here or there. This is happening all the time. I don't need to specify on the details. But we are trying to reduce unemployment very quickly. And if you now request companies to talk to the unions, they're going to fire and later talk to the unions. So there was an opinion that we should try to explain, look, we need to soften this, otherwise this will strengthen the unemployment rate. Many people are willing also to help and are proposing things. For example, we're not going to pay our bills, let's not collect taxes for a certain period. If we do this, we will disorganize the economic element. If we start to authorize interruptions in the vital functioning of the economic means and suspend payments, I would say that for the economy, the inverse will occur. From a health standpoint, we need to be as distant as possible and avoid contact. But in regarding the economy, we need to walk hand in hand. So you need to pay your suppliers, pay your clients, etc. If we suspend the payment mechanism, we quickly disorganize the productive sector. So our efforts have been to push in this direction and we have reached almost 500 million in aid and then we reach the law of public calamity. With this, we immediately launched the greatest protection network, which was to protect to inform, uh, protect informal workers, which was also extended to the Bolsa Familia, and the value was increased from two to three hundred reais. We always use the most conservative numbers first, and then we know of the political numbers and how this works. And the president, since he requested this protection later, asked to increase this from 500 to 600 to show that to save lives is our priority. This is the first most important step. So social isolation is perfect. We fully support this. Everything's okay. But also in a democracy, it's very valid to tell the truth. So there are two critical dimensions. There is the health dimension, but immediately afterwards we have the next wave, which has to do with economy. And depending on how we react to the first wave, we can worsen or not the second wave. We can be socially isolated, but the most of telework and social assistance to maintain payment to the weakest and also income for the unprotected and maintaining the vital channels open. Telecommunications, energy, food supply, all of this needs to work and function and companies know this so they give the masks they do the tests and wherever possible they maintain social distancing without necessarily isolating themselves so that they do not suspend the flow of food cities need food we have a super harvest we need to flow this production to the cities so that we can persist in the isolation without food people will leave the isolation and then we'll have a complete tragedy so this warning from the president is to think of the economy as well and this is extremely valid democracy is this we need to pay attention to all sides there is the side of health of the economy each one of course should express their opinion and of course we need to follow the recommendations of the minister of health during this entire period and if there are differences these differences need to be resolved as necessary and if the diverging opinions are very strong the president can change a minister but this does not represent 
that the president does not care about health. But for sure, there needs to be a consideration with the other side. We need to consider both sides and diverging opinions if very strong. It's not the minister who chooses the president, but the other way around. So we can understand that this by itself does not mean any disrespect towards preserving lives. To the contrary, that we also need to be concerned with the next dimension without disagreeing from the first. I have observed social isolation. I am in Brasilia. I have worked in isolation partially. I just came from there. Now I'm wearing a suit and tie. We had a long meeting there about what is underway. We did not stop. So to continue along this line of discussion, we reached the 500 million, and now we are in the constitutional space. Now we need emergency assistance for informal workers. This will probably exceed 100 billion, probably 114, 115 billion. And there are other details that include uh, taxi drivers. This was the. This was also foreseen in our first proposals. So all these jobs were all of a sudden interrupted. So no more uh, cab services. Also, people who sell things on the streets. So if there are no cars, how are these people going to live? No Brazilian can le be left behind. We need to take care of everyone. No Brazilian can be left behind. So if we are making mistakes in our execution, please help us. If you have a taxi driver uh, that you always use, make sure he knows that he can call Caixa Econômica Federal and by mean of an app he can receive 600 reais. So for the next three months he can survive. We need to do this together. It's not the time for disagreement among Brazilians. Lives are at risk. And it's time for each and every one to do their part and help each other. And we will cross this phase and we will reach the other side. And the economy will come stronger than what it was because it was already starting to give positive signs. And if we preserve the vital signs, we will reach the other side. To preserve the vital signs of the economy does not mean leaving the isolation now. It means doing things right, but knowing that this is a future point. This is happening in China. And China is also already planning to exit. And therefore, we have two dimensions. We need to think of both dimensions. You cannot just think of one. So we approved 100 billion for the emergency aid plan. Already released. And this came from the primary result. First, based on the Supreme Justice, Alexandre de Moraes, and this was ratified by Congress. It was now sent to the Senate, and the Senate will most likely approve this. So we have the structural reform. We halted the structural reforms for the time being and went to the emergency ones. So why were we relatively swift? For global standards, we are ahead of er, uh, than everyone. Nobody is better than us. Several programs that I'm going to mention now were done before programs done abroad. We had 100 billion of emergency aid for informal workers. Afterwards, we released 51 billion to complement salaries. So, free negotiation of salaries, 
and also reducing the workload up to 50%. So if the company takes on the commitment of maintaining jobs, of maintaining the workers during these three, four months or two months, we still do not know this duration. So the duration and the extent of the crisis, whether of the pandemic or the economic impact, and all forecasts. When somebody asks me what will be the primary result that you would ratify, I always say, said during the campaign that I want to go to zero. I want to do the best. But then people started saying, no, you promised zero. No. I prefer being kind of right than precisely wrong. So I prefer being committed to good practices and do the right thing than promising numbers. Numbers are easy to be read sometimes. I could have promised that the nominal deficit instead of 150 the preceding year would drop to 140. And then when I said 137, everybody would applaud. No, that's not what I want to do. We did 95, much lower. But we didn't promise. What we promised was to work in the right direction with the most effort possible. So the final data is the result of good work. So if the work is well done, the result is positive. So we need to focus on doing the right thing, not promising numbers that can be easily reached to say that we reached the goal. We will always try the big bull targets, always the impossible. And with, if we reach what is possible, we'll be happy. But, but if we do better, we'll be even happier. So, we had a strong reform that resulted from our work. Okay, we can celebrate. It wasn't the ideal, but I commemorate this and I'm very happy with the result. So, we were able to contain the first uncontrollable expenditure. This was growing 60, 100 billion every year, and in an uncontrollable fashion, we chipped off 100 billion a year at least. And this will generate almost 1 trillion in 10 years. We need to celebrate. This was an incredible partnership with the Brazilian Congress. So I'm very happy. And the Brazilian democracy delivered once again against the skeptic ones who did not believe in Brazil. They didn't believe in the economic team, in the president, or in Congress. And we delivered. In the second year, we had much better perspectives. We are hit once again. That has nothing to do with us. Something from abroad. Are we going to cry? No. Let's face this head on. Again. The first protection layer for the weakest, let's try to protect them as much as possible. And while in Congress they were discussing 5, 10 billion of the electoral funds, a senator said, let's take this and use this in health. And then people, they say that Mr. Paulo Guedes is saying that with 5 billion he's going to fight the crisis. No. I just seized the moment to say, let's take this money and insert it in the Brazilian health system. So give me these 5 billion. If you have 10, give me the 10. If you have the law of public calamity, let's place 300, 400 billion in this. We will not lack money for health. We have to do this in a responsible fashion, of course. So we got the 100 billion of aid for informal workers. We put another 51 billion to complement payrolls. We got 34 billion from banks for cash flow of companies between 360 up to 10 million in annual turnover. So these are the weaker in society. And this was to complement the salary compensation. So if the company wants to maintain the workers for three months, they can reduce the workload by 20-30%. We will complement this 
So if the worker received uh, 3,000 reais and he, his workload was dropped by 50%, we will complement the 50% of the severance fund. So we will basically pay the drop in salary. But what if the company says, even if I reduce by half the salary, I don't have enough cash flow for the other 1,000. Do you like this employee? Was the company doing well? Was this a virtuous company? Okay, here's your cash flow. So the payroll of the company is covered, where we are taking on 85% of the risk. So if the company does not pay, we will cover this. But we are protecting jobs, we are protecting lives, and we are protecting companies. So we had another 40 billion, another 100 billion of informal job protection, another 50 of salary add-ons. So we're up to around 700 billion right now. And the last news that you have with regard to the situation with governors, just to update you, the governors, they met with our president and they made their requests. They sent seven letters, and also mayors, the National Union or Council of Cities, and also one is of Jonas Donizete, of great capitals, and the other front represents another 5,000 cities. Everyone knows that our program is more Brazil and less Brasilia. We believe in the Federation. We think that this public calamity is an acute case of fiscal emergency. So that's why for us it was very quick to follow the protocol. What is the protocol here? We have created the Fiscal Council of the Republic, the President of the House, of the Senate, the President of the Court of Accounts. And if this is a public calamity, we can meet every week. This is an acute case of fiscal emergency. This is a health crisis, however. For example, if the sea were to rise three months, 70% of the Brazilian population lives on the coast. So imagine the city of Rio trying to move up the mountain because the sea flooded the city. Imagine the people on the Sao Paulo coastline going up to the city of Sao Paulo. And in the northeast, there are no mountains close by. Imagine what a catastrophe this would be. If this happens, this is an act of God in the federal level. So we would meet every three months and re-discuss this. So if we have an acute case of a fiscal emergency, we were preparing ourselves for a declaration of fiscal emergency from governors or mayors, etc. So whoever pressed the red button, they would declare a situation of calamity. And this was a huge expense. The first large expense was Social Security. The second largest expense were the interest rates. So we renegotiated this. The uh, gross indebtedness was growing, and we were also paying interest on this. We paid a lot of this off. We were able to decelerate this 
no quarto Pace ano, of mesmo, growth. 2022, todas as previsões do Instituto não eram essas. And everyone thought that we would drop this more slowly, but we dropped from 75 to 73 percent, and the interest rates, they plummeted as a result of this. Mansueta was expecting that we would spend 120 billion less in interest and for the next four years around 400 billion. So 100 billion less in Social Security, 100 billion less in interest. Now we have the third tower that is forthcoming. Salaries have grown above inflation for 17 straight years. Now we have coronavirus. We have millions of people losing their jobs. The public mach machine, would it be able to contribute here? Could they stay this year and next year without restating their salaries? Could they contribute with Brazil? Many people asked for a 25% drop in salary, reducing the workload. These workers are at home now. So we have 30% decrease in the workload and decreased pays, the salaries, by 30%. But that's not what we did. We thought that it would be more important not to take away the purchasing power, much to the contrary, we're injecting purchasing power into the economy. So we thought it was more important to lock this, to protect this. I'm under a threat here of having a power failure here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. They just told me here that you need to connect to another power source. I don't have any technician here to help me. I'm going to ask my daughter for a hand here so I am able to fix this before I have a problem. But if I drop out, I'll be back in just a few moments. Okay, I was able to make some arrangement here. But look. Amidst this shootout, this confusion, we may fall. We may fall to the ground, but we have a compass in our hand and we get up and we know what we're hunting. We know what we're pursuing and we know what we're pursuing. The three uncontrollable expenditures, Social Security, interest, and now the third one, the public machine which has been growing for 17, 18 straight years. Now, we cannot continue to afford this continuous growth and in an uncontrollable fashion. We're not going to take away the purchasing power of anybody. But let's talk with Brazilians. Let's do them a favor. Can we stay two years without asking for raises? Can we rely on this? I believe so. We have people that really stand out working here. Guardia knows very well the people surrounding us. Mansueto, Valderi, Guaranis, you know all these people. You have dealt with them. These are extraordinary people. They work morning, afternoon, and night. They are really spectacular people. And they say, Minister, we have to do something. We have to give our contribution. What is our contribution? And I always used to say this. I need to signal that this year was different. This year was an emergency, but not next year. This year was different. Next year, I need to be sure that all expenditures are in the right place. Interest rates will remain low. Social Security will have 100 billion less in privileges. Next year, we'll have 200 billion less in privileges because it's 100 per year. So, this is our countermeasure. And this is what we need to do in the, amidst this crisis. 
So we're following the protocol of the crisis. The emergency protocol, if this is a public calamity crisis, everything that we were thinking in the Federative Pact is raised to the 10th power here. If this was a quarterly meeting, now we need to hold daily meetings or weekly meetings. Our ministry restructured itself in three or four days. So our way of working was completely reformatted. So we have daily meetings, we have a crisis group. What was not extremely urgent was postponed. The PPI was also postponed. All of this is not emergency. And they are thinking that everything that we are discussing is to exit the crisis. But we will move out because we will accelerate the reforms. We're not going to stay in a room looking at each other. No. We will continue to move forward with the structural reforms once we get out of this lockdown. For example, basic sanitation. 100 million Brazilians could be washing their hands and preventing getting infected. We have moved forward a lot. The project is ready. We had extraordinary work. A huge team worked on this in Congress and everything is ready. So we need to approve this. The central bank is independent. We can approve this. In the G20 meeting and with in the meeting with the IMF, two meetings last week, everybody was talking about this. It's very important to signal an independent central bank because now that the fiscal expenditures are free. If everybody thinks that these expenditures, that the central bank is financing deficits, down the road the monetary policies will result in a final disaster. So on the one hand, we need to move forward with sanitation and sharing versus concessions. So why do so many companies want to explore oil in Brazil? We have an excellent project in the Senate that gives this freedom to decide whether this will be a sharing or a concession. We were a prisoner of this trap for many years and it was not effective at all. And this favors corruption because the government needs to renegotiate this every year. Even after the foreign investor buys the plots for the right to explore oil, they need to negotiate this with a state-owned company in order to know if they can or if they agree or not to explore oil, if they will maximize costs or profits. So this was a tool used by the French government to do business with corrupt African companies. The 17 largest oil companies come here to buy here. We have the oil and gas frontier, the mining frontier, the sanitation frontier, the concession and privatization frontier. All of this will pull us out of this situation. This will also help us. Public investments to conclude works that are underway and also public investments in uh, fiscal programs so that the youth can take technical courses. All of this is very good, but what will pull Brazil out of this low growth trap is to reactivate investments and for this you need a good business environment a good business environment simpler taxes lower taxes 
legislation that is favorable to businesses and it's inconceivable that the eighth economy of the world is 168th in terms of business quality. We need to understand that hostility towards businesses destroys jobs, knocks down growth. This is a trap for poverty. So we will persist on this path of transforming the Brazilian state. We will persist on this path. The president was elected based on this. And for us, it was relatively quick to elaborate the emergency plans in the social area because these are theses that we also subscribe. We know that the weakest need protection. This division is part of politics, but good economists know that the educational voucher, minimum income, this was created by Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago. The basic income proposal. So this care with social aspects we also have, but we know that we have to move out of a huge fiscal hole in which the economy, Brazilian economy lies. And within this context, uh, this isn't the last topic, this is the last move that we took, that we did in partnership with the governors. I was describing the situation in which governors, they came to talk with the president and everything that they requested was given and also more than what they asked for. If someone says that the, gov the president is persecuting this or that uh, governor, it's fake news. And this is unfair towards the president and also unfair towards us. The governors, they came here and they left very happy because what they requested was granted. They asked for four billion to be transferred to the public uh, health fund. They asked for four billion, we gave eight. And we gave this to the unified system of social assistance. And despite revenues having dropped, maintain the values that you have given us last year. We maintain this 16 billion in participation funds to states and cities. Even though we know that our revenue will plummet, we maintain the 16 billion value. So eight for health, double that what they requested, 10 for social assistance, 16 billion for participation funds of states and cities, and 20 billion uh, securitization, another 1.5 billion of school lunch uh, snacks. And this has already been signed off and is already being sent to the state. So the money has already left Brazilia. And let's not forget the direct health transfers. We first gave 20 billion to the former Minister of Health, Mandetta. We also got the uh, vehicle tax another 16 billion, 20 billion, another 20 billion that were authorized for securitization. And also interest rollover. And the principle of any debt until the end of the year, another 37 billion. So we quickly moved to a package of almost 80 billion, 78 billion to be exact. It's actually 88 billion because there were 10 billion of new money. There was a little chip of the Mansueto plan. There was, it was, there was still a, a remnant of the Mansueto plan. 
So the complete uh, package was around 88 billion. So the governor is left happy from here. One even commented with an entrepreneur who's my friend. It's, he's from a state in the north east. He said the ICMS could drop 59% because this already compensated until the end of the year. So they left completely happy. And then they come back two weeks later asking for something that Musuetu calculated at around 220 billion. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. To transform a health crisis in a political issue. This is non Republican. We cannot act like this. We will not jeopardize the future of Brazil and the future generations by transforming a very, very serious health crisis in a fiscal crisis by simply exploding the republic's budget. Does anyone know how long the crisis will last? How can we guarantee revenue if we are transferring 80 billion to states and cities. Why did we do this? To compensate revenue drops. You cannot transfer 80 billion to compensate loss in revenue and then say that you want a guarantee of the revenues. No, I'm compensating you for this. No, but I want an absolute and overall guarantee. We can't do that. And if the governor decides that isolation will continue for two years, how much will the GDP drop in that state? If that's an important state, how will we guarantee this? Where will we, will we get the money from? Will we guarantee money transfer to the richer states for several years? You live this here, Guardia. Do you think uh, the Kanjir law was a good one to guarantee revenue when you have no control over it, when you don't know what's going to happen? Even after the period, until now, there are requests based on the Kanjir law. Four billion requests. The government had not started yet, and unilaterally they said that they were going to transfer resources to states and cities. So last year they requested 4 billion of the Kanjir law and we transferred 11.6 billion. Three times that value this year in, under the Kanjir law it said that we were transferring 88 billion, 22 times the value of the Kanjir law. Does anybody question that we are attentive to the Federation? Does anybody have any doubts that we would cross this crisis the way we are if the Brazilian state was not consolidated? So, imagine if this was finishing and the health crisis was approaching. There wouldn't be this desperation looking for respirators or masks, etc. Everybody would be able to defend themselves. Cities and states, they would be strengthened. And they wouldn't have to wait for a great central plan. We are doing things that you don't know of because we don't have the time sometimes to communicate this. When the Minister of Health said that the problem was the lung ventilators, at the same time we froze the exports of hospital products and we reduced to zero the taxes on imports. And now we already have 300 products that are covered by this. So we are protecting the Brazilian population in all different possible ways.
We visited the four largest producers of ventilators in Brazil. One was a large company, a very strong one. And then we started to order these. And the second one was under chapter 11. So we acted to strengthen it so that they could also make these respirators. And then we also talked to foreign companies. So we have American companies today in Brazil and two smaller producers as well. We held meetings with 190 sectors associations here and there, including bars and restaurants, retailers, civil construction, to hear what they had to ask for. Of their requests, of these 190 sectors, we received 109 associations that sent us requests in writing of these 109 requests. Each one made seven to eight. So we had around 700 requests. They could be classified in 80 types. One would say, for example, allow for anticipated vacation. Another one would ask for collective vacation. So the item is the same. One is collective, the other one is individual. So we took these 700 and something requests, became, which dropped down to 80. And there were three types, tax requests, regulational, credit, and labor related. So these were the four types. So regulations. Airliners, they sold tickets, all aircraft are grounded, and they had to pay with a fine to those who asked for a refund. They said, look, we don't have any cash flow, we're under great stress, please waiver this fine so that we can postpone this, so the buyer, he can travel in the future. So this is a regulatory request. Then we have a credit request. Help us with our cash flow to pay for payroll. And also a tax request. Exempt us. We have deferred taxes. If we exempt one sector, and some sectors are suffering a lot, you need to grant this to another sector, to a fourth, to a fifth one. I would love to give these exemptions. But remember to maintain the vital signs preserved. If we start stimulating a situation of nobody paying anybody, we will stagnate the Brazilian economy. And to exit this crisis, we will depend on our capacity to maintain everything working. I will just go on for a few more minutes and then we stop. We're rushing a lot, so I've had very little time to talk with you. So I'd like to explain this a bit better. So we got all these requests, and we are helping wherever we can. We're, we're helping in the Ministry of Health, and we gave him $10 billion to help. And indirectly, we did this by means of states and cities, by percolating the funds to them to help fight this and we're doing as much as possible going to these companies today i received a report saying that we produced 50 now we're producing 100 and now we have increased to 600 ventilators per week. This is very good. Before, the forecast was that under the best circumstances, we'll be able to make uh, 300 something a month and now we're doing we're making 2400 if we have ventilators left over later that's fine because it's better to have too many than too little so we're really rushing and pushing things here 
And regarding financial aspects, just to wrap up and then open for questions, this last dimension, which is this large package. We reached 88 billion with governors. They were very happy. Two weeks later, they come back under Mussuetto's calculation for 220 billion. This was unacceptable. They reformulated the request. Apparently, the number is lower, but we had already granted 50 billion, but this was a very conservative number, depending on the extent and depth of the crisis. There were several principles that we could not accept. One was this, of the unpredictable. I cannot assume it's irresponsible to take on a commitment with something that is unpredictable. If the collapse were of 80, 90 percent of the revenue, and if we had a total collapse of payments and payments simply vanish, how am I going to sign something that three, six, 12 months from now, Brazil is bankrupt? So I cannot sign something that is unpredictable, that is completely unpredictable. When we talk about the predictions, you say that the GDP is going to drop 2%, 4%. Any well-prepared economist knows what is the change in regime. Changing the parameters is endogenous. All the prediction models do not work. Any economist making predictions is skating on thin ice. We know that the coefficients are endogenous. They become unstable. It's the criticism of Lucas to econometrics. The economic agents are atoms that think. This is not exact science, the same as biology. We do not know what is the contamination rate when we are going to overcome this virus. We don't know. Biology is an inexact science. There's nothing bad in this. We have empirical irregularities. This is extraordinarily useful. So it's always very useful to follow this, but there are moments in which there are discontinuations in the parameters, and this is one of those moments. So an economist made a forecast of 1%, another one said 4 Maybe one is optimistic, the other pessimistic, but I'm not going to commit to one or another forecast. We are going to do our best, we are going to preserve the vital signs, and we are going to get out of the situation as quickly as possible because we are committed with the reforms that will make Brazil grow once again. This is the path we will follow. So when the governors came back, they did not come back. We received a project, apparently. If we increase this to 220, the governors would support this. But here we have a conflict because I cannot I go to the, the edge of the river. I don't cross the river. And I stop there at the river bank. Apparently, things went to the Senate. The Senate annex this to another request. So this will now go back to the Senate, and we are working with the Senate on this. Yesterday, I stayed three hours talking to Davi Alcolumbre and several senators. There's a huge understanding as to the nature of the crisis. They also supported the emergency budget which has a lot of merit from the House, and I'm sure that Brazilian democracy will work very well, with a lot of noise, but achieving its results. So I think this week we will receive 
good news. I think things will move forward. I think that there will be a, an important consideration on behalf of the Senate. Based on the nature of this agreement, we had already reached uh, 78 billion. And with this perspective of 220, we had huge instability, but apparently with another 30 something, it is possible because in reality what is happening is that if there is a structural countermeasure, it's okay that this aid advances this little. For example, if salaries do not grow at all levels, and I would like to emphasize our learning from the Social Security reform. So the union made the reform, states and cities were left out, and later there was a huge struggle to gain this. So if we are able to have all salaries at all levels of the Federation, city halls, states, cities, and the federal government, if all of them commit to not have salary increases, I think this is an important signal that we knock down the third tower of uncontrolled costs. Costs will be uh, under control for at least the duration of this pandemic. So since we have this pandemic, everybody has to pay for this. Some are paying for this with their lives. Some people are losing their lives in the midst of this crisis. Some lost their jobs, their means of fending for themselves. So it is absolutely necessary to have a contribution from the public sector at all three levels cities, states, and the federation. So for two years, not talk about salary restatements. If somebody was promoted, this is one thing. Another thing is to have a generalized salary increase. So I think this is the countermeasure that the Senate understands and, to a certain extent, allows us to move forward with more resources to fight in the health dimension. Because it's not just health. Even though we want to prevent any problem of excessive spending during an election year, we know that public transportation, for example, cannot stop. If somebody is sick, buses need to stay in circulation, even if empty. Many people are asking to federalize this issue. No, it can't not be done this way. No, we send a bit more resources to states and cities, and each state and city needs to align with their transportation system this problem. If this program is more Brazil and less Brasilia, we cannot make public transportation a federal issue. For example, youth, they are at home because they're not going to school and they don't have enough to eat. So we need to send resources to states and cities and not them come request this from us. So we can expand the resources a bit more. For example, for school catering, assistance to the elderly, public transportation, and we can place a bit more resources in this package if there is a countermeasure of the public sector not restating its salaries. So I talked to a lot of senators and they are fully in agreement with the idea that this countermeasure should exist. It is the public opinion. The public opinion demands this and the government's uh, contribution. We are losing our jobs. We are losing family members. We are losing resources. And where is the government's contribution? What, where can the government help us? So this is something that the political sphere is sensitive to. President Davi Alcolumbre is conducting this at a personal level. 
yesterday, he stayed three and a half hours with me, and we called the president uh, to discuss several times about this. And I personally talked to several senators, and I will continue talking to them over the, the next few days, because we need to do this. And this is our democracy at work. Our democracy is like this. We try to align to provide results. We need this result. Everybody knows that money for health cannot be lacking, but everybody knows that this cannot become a, an electoral campaign issue. So I'll stop here. I would like to say that we are being tested. The crisis will mold the best in all of us. We need to be resilient. We need to cross this together. And this is not a party issue. It's not a left or right wing issue. No, we are Brazilians and together we need to cross this storm without losing our direction. These are trying times, but we will collaborate. We will contribute, all of us, and we will always live in a moment of collaboration. I don't want to fight with anyone. I always extend my hands to anyone who wants to help resolve the problems. The president is democratic. Sometimes he's he does his things. If there's a manifestation, he goes out there with a flag in hand and is waving and repeats the uh, cries of the audience. But he is democratic. He is committed towards this. We are committed towards democracy. We are democratic and liberals. And we are center right, and we have the right to continue with our form of government. We deserve this. We have worked very hard. The president is criticized every morning, every afternoon, and every night. Of course, he's human. He makes mistakes. But he is strong. He is tough. He continues with his ideals. He fights very strongly to not let Brazil slip in terms of practices, whether political or economical. But many people are helping us. Many people that might seem to have fought with us here or there, but these people have helped us. So there's a lot of noise, but remember the following. Believe in the process. Brazilian democracy is something vital, and we will cross this crisis. So let's open for questions, Eduardo. Thank you very much. We have many questions. I will try to focus here. But first, an issue that is of concern to everyone. It's a topic that you touched on, which is exiting this crisis, the recovery and the format of this recovery. Looking at the IMF uh, spring meeting in which you participated, the numbers are very negative for this year. The global GDP should shrink 5%. And in the US and in Europe, it's going to be stronger. In Latin America, it's also going to be quite uh, strong. You talked about a V-shaped recovery to bounce out of this crisis to, and also maintain the vital signs. My question is, for us to have a V-shaped exit, what more does the government have to do, or the V signs, is that it? And you also mentioned the reforms. I agree about the importance of the reforms for sustainable development, but this requires time for approval and for its economic effect after the approval of the reform. So my question is, what gives us this condition to think that we will have this uh, V recovery? and what will allow for this faster recovery of the economy. 
I always try to be very clear. Maybe this is my teacher's side and why sometimes I use extreme examples to illustrate a point. I don't want to sell dreams. I don't want to sell an easy way out or a quick ticket. This needs to be our attempt, and your question is perfect. What would we have to do for this to become a possibility? The attempt needs to be this. If we try very strongly, maybe we exit in a U. If we don't try, if we don't go for a V, maybe we are in an L shape. So I need to fight for a quick exit, and this will depend on the following. First, it's what I mentioned about China. Before knowing that this was a pandemic and that this was much more serious, and when you have social isolation, and this is the variable that you don't know how to deal with. You don't know how long this is going to last. You don't know how, uh, how fast this transmits, how many people will die. Since everything is unknown here, what was said abroad is that one-third of the impacts would have to do with the collapse of the global production change. So applying this to Brazil, so one-third comes from commerce from the commerce shutdown. We won't be able to bear with this. This will generate serious consequences. People will stop exporting to us. So several inputs will be lacking, etc. Then in some cases, you mention a 5 or 8% drop in the GDP. And one third will come from abroad. And the other two thirds will have to do with the internal market. So when you stay at home, you will decrease the vital signs of the economy. And this is why we have been discussing to have a vertical lockdown instead of a horizontal one. I normally don't like talking about this because I don't understand about health. So I simply follow orders of the Minister of Health. So if he says, I simply obey. But what might leave us a bit optimistic as to the exit speed when compared to others? Nobody knows the extent and the duration. But I know that the world was decelerating and Brazil was recovering, giving signs based on the structural reforms. So I cannot forget this, that Brazil was moving upwards and the world was moving downwards. And this was happening when we were caught by this shock. So now, I will look at the effect of the exports. Until now, the effect was zero. Of course, we lost in tourism, industrialized products, but we increased agribusiness exports, mining. So many sectors are increasing their exports. So this external whiplash didn't come yet. So now we need to focus internally. So what is happening inside Brazil? Vital signs are still preserved. Things are becoming critical. Of course they are. We don't know how long this lockdown will persist. And we don't know how long the economy will resist. We re really don't know. The Minister of Health was saying the following, that the curve would increase in April, in May, in, it would flatten, and in June it would start dropping. Now we're reaching the end of April, May and June. Does the economy withstand two more months of isolation? In July it starts dropping, everybody's going back, etc. So this is the question, and 
the point of discussion. The new minister is saying that he will base himself on data and studies and will study a scheduled exit. So we started formulating all these programs. Today we have a program that is being done, which is a microcredit, which goes from zero to 10 billion. And we have bank consortiums that are being set up. We already set up a committee, an internal committee. We're starting to call some bankers and discussing restructuring and how we can do this. We want this to be a market process. You cannot save sector A or company B. Our commitment is to save Brazilians, to save to, and protect the weakest and prepare the cash flow for two, three months, that might be difficult. So what we are doing is organizing things. So we're launching a micro credit program for small and mid-sized companies. And we're already talking to banks to protect the productive chains. We need to use the intelligence of the private sector. The private sector needs to help us. By the end of this crisis, I don't want to see a public bank at the end of this. Caixa is doing this. If we had already digitized the, the poorer classes of Brazil, we could already have transferred part of this to private banks. If we take companies in Brazil and say, look, those you will undergo a test. If you survive, great. If you don't survive, go home. This could also be done by the private sector, and large companies have offered support to us. Smaller companies, they will stay isolated. Family-owned companies, they will receive this aid and they will fend for two or three months. So we're trying to cover all different bases and profiles. So what is the effectiveness of these plans? We have created programs that sometimes are not effective. Sometimes with two, three billion, you can protect a lot more people. So we have tried to study the effectiveness. We still do not know the extent of the crisis, but we still have not felt that the economy is unstructured. We know the impact has been very strong, but it has not prevented a swift recovery. We need to fight for this not to happen. We are designing the first studies of how to pull out of the crisis. Of course, we did the FGTS, which is a severance fund. We already did this twice in a very well-based way. We joined uh, Pis Pazep to forms of taxes, and we already invited two, three generations to get this money. And we also have the severance fund, but we don't have enough liquidity to provide this to the population at large. When you have a fund that is very liquid versus another one that is not so much, all the owners can withdraw this money. You, we have already called three, four generations, but nobody went there to get this. So probably we need 20, 30 percent of that money in cash, but the rest we can program on this. 
we already invited people to withdraw the money for consumption. We need to also focus on investments. And the way we will bounce out of this crisis is by means of investments, improving the business environment, simplifying the tax structures, milestones for good business environments with oil, with sanitation. Many people abroad want to invest in sanitation in Brazil, not just fin international financial uh, entities, not just the IMF and governmental or bank organizations, also private banks. We had many public responses for private issues. Now we want private responses to public issues. So we really want to do this. Once the economy goes back to leaving isolation in an organized fashion, and we're discussing this with Congress, saying, gentlemen, we have never worked this much. Let's surprise the world. So how long will it take to approve something that has already been discussed in Congress and in the House? We are ready. We can approve this in one afternoon. So let's do this. The independent central bank, the same thing. Let's signal to the world that Brazil had a year of extraordinary expenses, but this will not mean the return of high inflation. You know that when we started, there was a discussion. Will we create an independent central bank? If the Temer government that was exiting wanted to donate an independent central bank, that would be something extraordinary. But this did not occur. Did I make this a priority? No. Social Security was a priority. The central bank already behaves in an independent way for a long time in our economy. We had two central bank presidents that did fabulous work here. So here we already have a culture before sanctioning a law. In monetary possible uh, policies, we have a culture that has been shaped before a law. We already have a law of fiscal responsibility, but we don't have the culture for this. So we all always go over budget in cities and states and at a federal level, despite there being a law. So the priority now is to create a solid, good environment. And we will try to work together with Congress, as the president has always done, and the House and the Senate, and the president together will open this. Let's prepare the V-shaped recovery. Let's show that members of Congress have used the shutdown to focus on this. And while attacking the health problems, they also tackled the reforms. This will guarantee an extraordinary year and that Brazil continues on the right track. Let's talk a bit more about the reforms and tax and fiscal reforms. Before talking about the coronavirus, we had a gradual tax adjustment approach. We knew this was not enough, but it was the pillar of this gradual adjustment. So the tax reform in this context was to remove the distortions, remove aggressiveness, and provide Brazil with more efficiency. Given the degree of fiscal deterioration that we will see as a result of the reaction to this crisis, is it still possible to work in gradually reducing expenditures and look at the tax issue just based on economic efficiency and reduction in re regression? So my question basically is, how will we pay for this bill? 
Will we be able to save taxes along the road? Basically, we do not want to increase taxes. We believe that Brazil has too many taxes. And we have a tax madhouse. Brazil is hostile to entrepreneurs. Brazil is hostile to generating and creating jobs. I never stopped tackling taxes on payroll. This is a weapon of mass destruction for jobs. 40 million Brazilians with informal jobs, they are condemned. They have no technology to increase their salaries or their living conditions. It is a crime that we commit against them by placing taxes in the most wrong of places, which is upon payroll. This is a crime against Brazilians. We need to find an alternative fashion of collecting and levying these taxes, which is not upon labor. So the, the way out will not be to increase taxes. This year needs to be an extraordinary one. And maybe we will have a net indebtedness this year. Last year, we deleveraged pu public banks, we lost some reserves, we were able to tackle some fundamentals with Social Security, and interest dropped, and we saved 120 billion in interest this year. So we need to continue following what works. So if Caixa Econômica Federal has great profits this year, send us over the dividends. Please send these dividends our way. BNDS at this moment cannot afford to do this. They cannot deleverage. So leave BNDS aside this year. They don't send us any resources, but it needs to participate in the programs and maybe we will need to contract loans abroad to help everybody in here. And one of its vocations was to be an export-import bank, so it could get cheap international loans and bring this and help the Brazilian productive chains. So both BNDS plus private banks are working hand in hand to focus on productive change. For example, if a company that orders airplanes and the company is stopped, that airplane will cease to exist. This is something terrible. So the aircraft is grounded, but soon the aircraft will be flying again. And then they will order 26 airplanes from Embraer, and they will order plastic and rubber and other materials that are necessary for that productive chain, engines, etc. So who has this intelligence? The banks are the creditors of these large companies. Do you think this crisis increased protectionism and opposition to multilateralism and do you think this will make exports more difficult? Certainly. When great tragedies occur like this one, you attempt trailing some existing paths. Protectionism worsened the Great Depression in the 20s. It was worse. So everybody will try to protect themselves to a certain extent. This already happens with... Uh, with the currency rates. Sometimes... If, if you're very dirty, you need to cover, you need to carry more reserves. Some companies, they have some trillions, some have hundreds of billions, and some countries, they have very few in fluctuation. 
So sometimes you see issues like somebody wants to win an election and afterwards they increase the the interest rate and then they have a snowball indebtedness effect and this will affect future generations and sometimes they want to say look I have large reserves no anyway we have tried to pay for this cost as soon as possible if I could I would accelerate privatizations and if the world starts improving we sell off one state-owned company to and you know that you can finance a deficit. So we need to differentiate permanent versus transitory expenses. So we want to recalibrate the permanent expenses and the emergency expenses that we have right now. You can pay in extraordinary means as well. So maybe you spent a lot this year, but I deleveraged here. I sold off a bit here. I privatized two companies over there. So it is legitimate to have extraordinary expenses by demobilizing some assets. It's as if it were a company. So I spent too much this year, I sold off two assets. So some companies, they sell subsidiaries and they move on. So what's important? The speed of exit from this black hole. And this will depend, as I have always said, of moving forward with the structural reforms. If you focus on an important future, this will be nothing more than a tough year. If you do not conduct the structuring reforms, this will not be one year of a nightmare. This will be the beginning of a nightmare. You start contaminating the following year and then the following, so on and so forth. So, how can we levy taxes to pay for this year's losses? Depending on the GDP drop, so this is why it's so important to maintain the vital signs of the economy. If the economy drops to zero, the primary uh, expenditure increased 3.8%, but next year it goes back to 1.5, 1.6% of the GDP, and interest rates are dropping. So the financial component is decreasing, and then everything becomes absorbable. So this was a difficult year, but next year the important expenditures are being lowered again. So I insist, we need to use resources and assets, demobilize assets that we can this year to decrease indebtedness. And we need to be obsessive about this so that this year, which was extremely difficult, does not contaminate our speed of escape. Our speed of escape will depend on primary investments. We will have some public investments, but the numbers are low. If you take the public investment numbers here, it's 1.5, 1.2% of the GDP. If you double or triple this, it's very little. So you'll move from 10, 15 billion and move up to 30 billion. This is not what will pull Brazil out of this hole. But you know that the private sector is capable of mobilizing 100, 150, 200 billion in two years. If you just take the investments in oil, for example, we could have received 100 billion last year in the pre-salt. So it just depended on our attitude to the business environment. If this was a good business environment, we could have brought 100 billion. Sanitation, we could have brought another 100 billion. Concessions could have brought another 100 billion. Yes, Paulo, everything depends on the National Congress so that we can move forward this agenda. My question is, 
if this tension that we are living with the states, this always has a strong repercussion on the Congress. Do you think this can jeopardize our capacity of moving forward with reforms as of now or in the future? I will repeat what I have always said. I was asking myself this question at the beginning of the government. You know this. You know of the difficulties and expectations and you gave me a light smile when I asked if you wanted to stay with something and you signaled already helped enough I think things are very tough so you know that things are quite troublesome what was the result the president had less support from Congress than the former president, Tamer. Tamer was probably more favorable to the Social Security reform than you thought Bolsonaro would be. There was no solid basis in Congress, etc. And I always said, I believe that the president will be a shield for the reforms. He will guarantee the working environment for the reforms. First hypothesis. Second hypothesis. I bet on the Brazilian Congress in moving forward with the reforms. What was the result by the end of the year? A president who apparently did not have support from Congress, he delivered a reform that was two times stronger than the other president. And you can't say, no, at the time you had the scandal, etc. No, he could have put this reform as the first measure. What, but why didn't he put this as a priority, this reform? Minister Meirelli said 50% is strategies, 50% is execution. Execution and strategy would be to set the social security reform as a priority and execution would be to execute. And apparently he was not able to execute this. So, supposedly, he was saying, no, we need to revisit this execution. The problem of the current uh, government is the execution. The strategy seems good, but the execution there was not there. You have been there. You know that the execution is not easy. Why were we able to do this? Because Congress supported us. So, do not be impressed by the noise. Brazilian democracy is loud. We bang pans. You have those, those horns in stadiums. Those, those noise canisters in stadiums. We have fights every day, but we deliver. We are delivering, and we will continue to deliver the reform will suffer a distension. After all this noise that we have seen, I think now we will have a distension. Why? People are dying. There are lives at stake. Who attempts to transform this into political discourse will be poorly assessed by the population. There are lives at stake. Everybody needs to work together, regardless of parties, of being opposition or situation, and personal misunderstandings. Sometimes there are there's a, a chemistry issue. Maybe this person doesn't get along with the president or this person doesn't get along with that one, but this is irrelevant. There's a mission to be fulfilled. There's a duty to be followed. Anything personal is smaller than the health of all Brazilians, of the life and jobs of all Brazilians. So. I believe in this fully. The pressure is very large. Sometimes I forgive. Sometimes people offend me. I wasn't... I, I used to be like this when I was young. Fighting makes you feel young and alive. But as you get older, you start understanding the other side. Sometimes a, someone is younger 
and is pressuring someone who is frail at that moment and offends a person, but you can't get into this. They will collaborate down the road. They have already collaborated in the past. They also want to help Brazil. So we need to understand this and everybody needs to work together. So I tell you the following. I think we will have an important moment coming up now. This agreement with governors and mayors will show our commitment towards the state and preserving lives and towards health. But there will be a countermeasure that will show to everyone that everyone is serious in their purpose of controlling large expenditures and two years with the public sector, public servants not restating their salaries. This will be an important signal to investors and to the uh, population at large. And this means that we can resume our agenda maybe in three, four months' time. Maybe the sanitation investments have already been resumed Maybe the first auctions for privatizations have already resumed. This is our idea. We hope that in the second semester we are back and fighting the second wave of the economy. The first wave, we're still struggling with it. The second wave is already on setting, but we think that in two, three months' time we are already at the other side. We don't know in what condition but we will work. And the more we work, in a better condition, we will exit all of this. Paulo, we have already been chatting for two hours. We still have many, many questions, but I would like to thank you very much for your availability, for your time, and congratulate you for your work. We know how difficult it is to do things at this time and your team, which is extraordinary, is rowing in the right direction so that we can exit this crisis stronger and as quickly as possible resume the direction that we want, productivity, income, international insertion, and I'm sure this is your agenda. So on behalf of BTG Pactual, thank you very much for being with us for two hours, and you can really count on us to help you with any initiative that you find important. I would like to thank all of you, and I would like to say the following. We need you. We need you. Whether in restructuring things, now we have extreme fragility. You know better than anybody that the response to these challenges is what makes the entrepreneur sector more productive and more efficient. So it is at times like this, you saw there in the United States when there was the 2008 collapse and Warren Buffett took uh, 8%, 10%, and he invested in this group that was very important. Uh, Goldman was inspiring for Pactual. We had 10% of what Goldman had in terms of assets, and they were able to restructure large companies that faced difficulties at one point or another. This is the moment in which you need to come forth and say, look, I know you're good, we are with you, and we will offer many things in terms of of two large banks to facilitate this. So we are there and we will offer opportunities to help these companies and groups survive. The Brazilian population will make money by helping large companies that deserve to be preserved. So we rely a lot on you. So test. 
I should advertise this company, but I cannot. And further down the road, I will thank everyone who helped us. They offered one million tests and they gave 70,000 to employees and they were going to donate another 930,000 throughout Brazil. So let's help everyone, the cab driver, the cleaning person, maintain their payments, maintain the hairdresser's payment. Let's show that we care about everyone, from the smallest attitudes to the largest companies, with structures that allow us to cross this. So we count a lot on the private sector. I believe in the markets. We will bounce out of this crisis, and we will exit based on private investments, based on a good business environment being created. Money from abroad, money from within. We will transform this crisis into a deep opportunity for growth. We know that if this money is already decentralized, Brazilians will have more capacity to defend themselves. If we were already moving forward with this uh, federative pact, Brazilians would be able to participate. If sanitation had already been approved, 100 million Brazilians would be washing their hands, avoiding contamination. So we need to exit like this, and we rely on the private sector. And we also rely on the contribution of the public sector and the private sector. So everyone needs to give what they have best during a moment of crisis like this. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for the opportunity, and we will cross together. I would just like to reinforce this last point. I think the private sector has shown to be uh, solidary during this moment. We at BTG, we have not laid off any employees and we have partners at the bank who are offering resources. So the private sector in general is mobilizing and doing its part so that we can exit this in the best possible way. I would to once again thank you very much for your availability to stay here two hours with us and certainly this was very enriching to everyone thank you very much and good luck and all the best to all of you thank you